clap offering this morning. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come into this room today to worship you, Jesus, and to glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, on this big game day, Lord, we want to celebrate the true victor of the greatest game, which was the game that was done and waged for our soul. And Lord, we want you to be lifted up in all that we do in this church service today. We'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for we ask. And say it with me, church, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. You're glad to be in church today? We hope for those of you who are watching online, we're glad that you're tuning in because the most important thing you'll watch today isn't this afternoon, it's right now. Amen? Amen. So let's keep worshiping the Lord.
God who made a way for our salvation still makes the way in our lives today. Amen. Amen. If you take your communion cup with me this morning, if you didn't get one when you were coming in this morning, um, if maybe we could have a couple of the, maybe one of the ushers, Gene, if you wouldn't mind just grabbing one of those buckets. If you just didn't get one this morning, just raise your hand. They'll bring, they'll bring it up by you today. Today, I'm thankful that our God is alive. Amen. We have a God who made the greatest way, which was the way into heaven. He made his, the way into the throne room of God because of the blood that he shed on the cross. On the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you do eat this bread, you do show forth my death. So if you would just grab that cup and take the bread and let's give him thanks for that body that made away. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to this earth. You sent your son into this world to become flesh and to offer that flesh on the cross that we could be made whole. So Lord, this morning I want to pray, Lord, for all that might be sick, for all that might need a healing in their body today. We pray for Larry Kistler this morning. Lord, you just know, Father, that he had to go back in. He had fractured that new hip that he had. Lord, he had to go back in and have another surgery this week. We pray, Lord, for, Lord, a quicker recovery. Lord, they said that it would take longer, but, Lord, we're asking you to be the way maker for Larry today and to just bring healing into his body this morning. For any others that might be struggling with sickness, Lord Jesus, Lord, cancer or, 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 or body ailments, flus, COVID, whatever it might be going on today, that, Lord, you would be the great physician today in every body, in every life. Jesus, we thank you for the bread. We thank you for your body. And we thank you that you gave it for us. Let's partake together. And then he took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of a New Testament. As often as you drink this cup, you do show forth my death. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Nothing could wash away the wrong that we had done. Nothing could wash away our sins except for the blood of Jesus. Lord, today we thank you for the cup that we hold in our hand. Lord, no matter what wrong we've committed, no matter what sin we've, we, we've partaken of, Lord, your blood made it possible that if we confess that sin, that you promise to be faithful and just to forgive us of all our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No other cup, no other blood could wash that sin away. But your blood was enough. It was enough. Powerful to cleanse. And we thank you, Jesus, today for your forgiveness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love and for the sacrifice you made for us. Let's partake in the cup together. Let's just thank him, church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you made Jesus. Lord, I pray for anyone that be in this room today that has need. Lord, other needs in their life today that maybe we haven't mentioned already. Lord, I want to remember Donna, Lord, this, this woman who's been brought before you, Lord. She's a Lord, a, a Christian from Lebanon, Lord God, and you see that there's a battle going on in her family. God, I pray that you would just be released into that situation, that your will would be done in that circumstance in her life. Father, for any others, Lord, for marriages, Lord God, for homes that need healing, restoration, Lord, 
for those who are needing to be set free from bondages, God. We look to you. We look to that blood, Lord. You are the way maker. You made that way on the cross through your blood. And we look to you today, Lord Jesus, to make that way in our lives. No matter what we're going through, the one who made the way on the cross, that you're still making the way in our lives today. We give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. We ask a church, say it with me, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated today. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Destiny. It's so sweet to be together again worshiping the Lord. An important way we worship is through giving. If you're here in person, the greeters will be right outside after service to collect tithe and offering. It's also very easy to give online at yourdestinychurch.org. There's also the option to mail in your tithe and offering at PO Box 144, Fort Lupton, Colorado 80621. Now let's check out what's coming up here at Destiny. Our next round of D groups have begun, but it's not too late to jump in. Talk to any of those group leaders if you want to join. This week, Pastor and Miss Kimberly will actually be out of town enjoying some well-deserved rest. If you need anything, feel free to call myself or any of our deacons. Next Sunday, we will have George and Linda Stanky here sharing in our morning service. 
Make sure you're here for that and I believe it will be a blessing for everyone. Saturday, February 20th, we will be having men's breakfast here at the church at 9 a.m. February 28th, we will be having our annual business meeting for members and adherents right after church. At that meeting, Gil Martinez will be presented for ratification for a second three-year term as a deacon here at Destiny. If you have any questions about any of these announcements, feel free to ask a staff member or check out the bulletin we gave you on your way in. In the back of that bulletin, there's also a connect card that we'd love for you to fill out. Let us know how you're doing and how we can pray for you. Also, if you're a first time guest, this is a great starting point to get plugged in here at Destiny. If you're with us online, there's also an online version of that card on our website. Thank you all for keeping those social distancing standards. We're coming up on a year now that this has been our normal practice, but everyone has been doing a great job and we are so thankful. Thank you all for worshiping with us today. Whether you're here in person or you're joining us online, we are so glad you're here. Smile, everybody. There you go. Someone turned me on. Woo. Okay. Game on. Whoa, we can take a little reverb out of here too. Thank you. All right. It's the big game day. I don't care. <laughs> not only are the Patriots or the Broncos not playing, but I don't know. Football just doesn't seem to be what it all used to be. But I know for many of you, you're all excited. You're pumped up about the big day. In honor of, of Denver, I wore orange this morning uh, to, to recognize um, someone better than the other teams. And people have asked me, are you rooting for Tom Brady because I'm a Pats fan? I'm like, no, because he doesn't play for the Patriots anymore, so why do I need to vote for him or root for him? I guess we're not voting, we're just rooting. But I want to talk about a greater game and the game on for a greater game than what's going to take place this afternoon. And that's our spiritual game. There's a greater game, a more important game than the game that all of America seems to tune into on the first Sunday of every February. And that's our spiritual game. How many of you are already engaged in that game? You see, I'm going to talk this morning from a premise 
believing that the majority in this room, and even the majority of probably people watching online this morning, that you're already in this game. You've already accepted the challenge to get in and be a player and to get your spiritual game on. There are a lot of people in the world who are spectators of other people's spiritual game. They sit on the side. They sit in the bleachers. They eat the junk food of the world, you know, the hot dogs and the popcorn and the pizza. And they eat all that junk food that this world has to offer in a spiritual sense. That will be all the things, all the sins, the pleasures of this life. And they watch other people get their spiritual game on. But today I want to talk to those of us who are in the game. And I want to talk because some of you might be sitting benched and you need to get back in the game. You need to not just even be on the bench. You're on the team, but you're really not participating. But I want to talk about what it is because, you see, we have this prize that we're aiming for, and that prize is heaven. And there are things that relate to things like sports and athletics and football games that relate to our spiritual life as well. Christ has already paid the price. We know that in the long run we are winners. But you know what? God doesn't want you to be that guy on the bench who's letting everybody else do the work to win the Super Bowl. You know what I'm saying? You always have those players who never get out into the game, but they still get the ring. There are a lot of Christians living like that today. But I don't know about you, that's not how I want to live my walk with Christ. Football didn't really quite exist in Paul's day or Jesus' day. But other athletics did. And in that, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 9.24. He says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs. But only one person gets the prize. So run to win. You see, in this game, this spiritual game, we're not allowed to be on the side. Everyone needs to run. And then he says, run to win. Run to win. Run to win this game. Run to gain those things that God wants us to win, to grab hold of the game and to participate and to play the way God wants us to. And there are three key things that are needed in every player and in every game that has ever done that make it a success. And I want to talk about those three things today. The first is defense. How many know that defense is really important? You know, chances are, if you're playing football, you can have a great offense, but if you don't have a good defense, you're just going to be seeing the ball going back and forth and scores taking place left and right. You have to, you can always be on the offensive, but if there's no defense, it's going to be really hard to actually win a game. In fact, there are 11 Super Bowls that have been credited to winning solely because of defense. And it was the defense that really is what caused them. They kept the other team from scoring and because of it. One of those is everybody in this room probably's favorite Super Bowl 50 with the Broncos. It was actually the greatest defense game ever played. They said that there were only, the Broncos only gained 193 yards. That is 50 short of the second shortest amount of yards ever gained before in a game which means that their game was gained and won because they had good defense. You know, it's important to be on the offense. We'll talk about that in a minute. But how many of you Christians know that if our defense, if we're not ready on the defense, we're going to get into trouble. We're going to have problems. You see, the enemy has been studying us. Just like in football, teams will watch plays and they'll watch video of other football teams and they'll, they'll examine what the other team does, where their weaknesses are, where their open spaces are that they can make a game to run through and, and how people make their plays. They look and they study. The enemy is studying us because he's ro roaming around seeking what he, who he can devour. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And just like any good team is going to go when they're on the offense, is going to look for the defense's weakness. We have to be ready to stand in the gap. We have to be ready to keep the enemy from scoring in our lives. You know, so many Christians live with their defense down. They live like they're not even expecting to have to deal with defense in their life. You know, I think of what, what does any good football player do before he goes out in the field? He puts on his uniform, and underneath that is all kinds of pads. He's padding up his shoulders, he's padding up his chest, he's padding up his legs. He's getting his cleats on. Why? So he can have traction in the ground. 
got his helmet on and his mouth guard because he's going to protect himself because he knows the enemy's going to come at him full force to steamroll him and knock him over. Christian, we have the same thing that we need to do in defense. I know it's a familiar passage of scripture for some of us, but let me read it to you again. Ephesians 6, 11 to 18, just to remind us of the importance of defense in the Christian's life. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Sounds like a game to me. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. Can you imagine a football player without his cleats or without his helmet or without his shoulder pads? Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body of God's righteousness, the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. And in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. You know, if you got a game player going out and he doesn't have the right equipment on, he doesn't have the right pads, the right cleats, and, and, and he's weakened, he becomes a weak spot for the team. He becomes an easy tackle, someone that can be taken down. If a player is not paying attention to the plays and the moves. I remember when I was a kid, my dad wanted me to play football. I've never really liked football a ton because of this experience in my life. So I'm going to share I'm going to share a little bit of my childhood here in this moment. My dad, I went I remember doing all the it was called the Pop Warner League where I was. And I remember going to Pop Warner League when I was a kid and going through weeks and weeks of this of this practice before, you know where you have to kind of like run in place and fall on the ground and run in place and like and you, you just kind of like made yourself hurt and ache and get tired and run around. I didn't like that that much, but I did it for weeks. And then my parents decided to go on vacation the week that they were teaching all the plays. And so we go on vacation. I come back. I have no clue what anybody is doing. I'm like, I did all of that training and prep just to be clueless about the strategy of the game. And I remember going to my dad and saying, I don't want to play. Because I didn't know what I was doing. And rather than learning what the strategies was, I quit. I never played football, and I didn't watch it until I became an adult. Because I felt that bad because I didn't know how to play the game. But how many Christians are living their spiritual game that way? How many Christians are living, are you out there today? Oh, there's a mark on your face, but you can smile at me, all right? How many Christians are playing the game, the spiritual game, and they've kind of entered into this game, and they've kind of gotten off the bench, and you're on the field, but you have no ideas what the strategies are. You have no idea. The enemy has been studying you. He knows your weakness. He knows what brings you pleasure. He knows what, what you are tempted by. He knows how to knock you over. He's found out what part of your body's been injured before that he can go after to take you down or to take you out of the game. He understands you, but do you understand him, and are you ready and on that defense? Because, you see, the enemy wants to psych you out. He wants you to think that he's got you. But that's why God's given us the equipment so we can be prepared. He's given us the salvation, the salvation that comes to us, the salvation that is our confidence. You know, when, when we confess our sins before God and he forgives us of our sins, that salvation comes up against all the strategies when the devil tries to tell you you're not saved or he tries to remind you of every mistake you've ever made or he tells you of all of your past and your failures. Yet in your mind when it's battling, when the enemy comes after you to crash into your head and tell you none of this is working, you're not saved. God says, hold it, you've got that helmet of salvation on. That salvation tells you that it's not by your works of righteousness that I've done, that you've done, but by my grace, by my sacrifice. We sang about it, we celebrate it in communion. You're saved because of me. And then there's that peace because the enemy wants to bring turmoil into your life. 
How many Christians, when they're playing the spiritual game, give up and, and, and fall down and get tackled and get taken out of the game because when trouble comes, they don't have peace to hold on to. When trouble comes, their feet are not sure and their, their, their peace is robbed from them. But what's the peace? It's the gospel of peace, the shoes, the good news of Jesus Christ. What's the good news of Jesus Christ? That Christ is there in the midst of every circumstance with us. That Christ is the powerful miracle worker in every circumstance. That no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're walking through, we can endure any storm because he's with us. That's our peace. And you know what that is? It's like a cleat digging into the ground. It gives you traction to stand. And then that truth. When the enemy tries to bring the lies because his greatest deception, his greatest weakness in our life. He's trying to run interference. He's trying to run through the, through the empty holes in our line. It's because it goes through lies. He tries to deceive us or make us believe lies in this world today or that, that you can't make it or these things can't be done. But we have the truth of who God is. And when we're living right, you know what? It's really hard for the enemy to take down people who are living right. When you know you're living in righteousness... When you know that you're walking by the righteousness that God gave you to walk in, and instead of yielding to sin, you're, you're standing in strength, it's really hard for the enemy to attack. And faith, he wants to get you to not believe. He wants to make everything in your world seem like it's hopeless. But when we trust in God and we believe in him, man, we're, we're standing strong. And God's word and prayer, those are offensive weapons. But they help us to stand strong against all of the offense that the enemy brings at us by having a good defensive game. Christian, you're not going to succeed in the game of this spiritual life if you're not wearing your defense. If your defense is not up. We need to put on the armor of God. We need to bear the armor. We need to put on the equipment and be prepared. And then there's offense. Okay. I understood I just said that 11 Super Bowls were won by defense, but someone had to score somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Because if there were 11 of those games, you know, there were over 40 games that were won by offense. You know, I see a lot of Christians, they never get off the defense. I don't know about you, but when I watch a football game and all I ever see is my team on defense, I get bored. Because it's always about, I, I just want them to get the control of the ball so they can score again. I just want them to, to have forward motion. Because if all you ever are is being pushed down the field towards your end zone, to where the enemy scoring against you, you're never making motion towards the progress that you need to make. And there are so many Christians today, we live our life only having a good defense. We, maybe we've learned that good defense. Maybe we've put good defensive practices into our spiritual walk. But God doesn't want you. And there are a lot of people who sit in churches week after week or week. They're faithful. They've learned a good defense. But God wants you to also go on the offense. You cannot score. You cannot win victories in the kingdom if you're not moving forward in Christ. It is the offensive moves that brings victory. It's the offensive moves that scores the touchdowns. If you're going to gain ground, you're going to have to go on the offensive and go after the enemy. Oh, but if I do that, he might attack me. There's so many Christians, just, we're wimps. We're afraid that if we begin making an offense in our life to go after, to, to extend the kingdom of God, to, to attain spiritual goals, to, to draw closer to Christ, to get to know him more, that if we start putting those spirit, because I see this happen all the time. People hear a message, they get challenged in their faith, they go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue Jesus more, I'm going to go on the offense, and they go on the offense, and as soon as they do, boom, the enemy just tackles them right there and knocks them off. Just makes a mess out of everything, doesn't he? Illustration better than I thought. And we're afraid. But we have to still go on the, Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, and from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, there's rubber up here, it's only water, it's all good. So, And from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. And violent people are attacking it. In other words, when we go to make that advance, things are going to come against it. The devil's going to come against it. Demonic forces are going to come against it. 
non-Christian people who despise what we stand for are going to come against it. But nonetheless, the kingdom of God must have forward motion. We are not on a, a downhill path. We're on an uphill climb, which means that gravity is pushing against us, which means that we're swimming against the current in this world, which means when we're making, we, if we stop making forward motion, we're going to be pushed backward. So we have to not, we can't be stagnant. We must move to go forward. And sometimes we have to make motion just to hold our ground. But we need to not just plan on holding our ground. We need to push back to make the goals. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said to Peter, says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, meaning Christ, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. You see, we have this promise from God that he says, I want to build my church and I want to build it through my people. So therefore, you need to come into the kingdom and you need to go on the offense in the kingdom so we can win this game. So we can, so we can take the enemy out. So we can draw. You see, the, the thing is, the end of the game is determined. You got that? The end of the game is determined. Jesus wins. Okay? We are going to be winners. But the thing is, the, the real goal that's going that we're going after is how many people are we taking with us? How many will we take with us on the winning side? Because the enemy knows he's a loser. He just wants other people to lose too. So is L going to stand for loser in our life or is it going to stand for leader in our life? Are we going to be losers and let people be lost to the kingdom of darkness? Or are we going to be leaders and lead people to the kingdom of heaven? Are we going to go on the offense so other people can find Christ? And are we going to live our lives so that we can be gaining Christ and becoming more like him in our own lives? What kind of spiritual goals do we have in our lives that we're pushing to spiritually attain? Are we looking for a closer walk with Jesus? Or are we just happy with where we're at? Are we pursuing a greater knowledge of Christ? It's not going to happen if you... Don't get into the Word if you don't get into Bible study, if you don't get into church. You're not going to know Him more. If you're not spending time with Him in prayer, you're not going to grow at all. Are we growing in the Word? Are we seeking the Holy Spirit? Do we want the power of God's Spirit to not only just be in our lives, but to be overflowing our lives with power? That, that His power enables us to speak to others and share with others and to, to have the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit flowing out of our lives? Are we proclaiming Jesus to those around us? There's some scripture that comes with all of that. James 4, 8 says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. If you're in the game, you know, you know it's a, I, I think one of the greatest challenges I had when we moved here after living in Arizona for like 13 years, we used to go to all kinds of different sporting events because it was one of the first times we lived right, you know, in the city and we could just go to them on a regular basis. And so I, I got to really rooting for teams. You know, there's two kinds of people in Arizona. No one's from Arizona unless you're, like, under the age of 20. Everybody was from somewhere else. They literally made team shirts that had the Arizona team on one side and the team that you came from on the back and stuff and, and, and stuff. And stuff. And when I came here, the first four sporting events I went to over the first several years, it seemed like every time, I didn't even plan the event. Sometimes I was going in other groups. Every single time they were playing an Arizona team, I was really pulled. In fact, my first Super Bowl here, I rooted for the Broncos, and my son about disowned me because I didn't root for the Patriots. I'm like, I live in Denver. I got to root for the Broncos. It's my first year. My church is going to disown me if I don't root for the Orange team. And then the next year when the Patriots were, he's like, traitor, you can't root for them this year. I'm like, but the Broncos aren't playing. Traitor, he's just, you know. We sometimes are pulled between two worlds. But Jesus is saying, draw close to me. If you draw near to me, I promise I will draw near to you. Do we have a goal to get away from the world and draw closer to God? Do we have a goal in our life to draw closer to the Lord? Because, you know, when you do, the enemy's going to come and try and tackle you. But he says, wash your hands, purify your hearts. He's saying, get rid of the world, wash it out of your life. You would tell me, ditching the patriots is washing the sins of the world away. 
And embracing the Broncos is embracing the purity of God. Draw near to God and God will come close to you. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Have we said, I want to get rid of the stuff from this world. I want to get rid of the things that, that hold me down, that keep me defeated. I want to get rid of the things that, 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 that just keep me from being able to be successful as a Christian. I want to drop those things out of my life. You know, there's so many things that I could go over today. You know, we could start with the typical, the drugs, the alcohol, the, the pornography. But what about the, the, the unforgiveness and the bitterness and the other stuff? There's so many things that we need to say, God, take these things out of my life so I can, I can run with speed and be effective so I can score touchdowns and be victorious as a Christian and not just always fighting a defense. Because, you see, that's what happens. We're just always fighting the defense where God wants us to go on the offense. Paul writes in Philippians 3.10, he says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Huh? Do we have a goal to understand the depth? You see, no one, no, no athlete becomes better at his sport without paying a price. No athlete, no pain, no gain. Sometimes it's the pain that we go through in life that brings us the gain spiritually because that's where we begin to experience the power of God instead of ours. Hebrews 5.14 says, Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. If all you want is the, is the easy drinking milk of God's word and the easy stuff, the bless me, bless me, and we never get into the solid meat of the word and we digest it into our lives, we'll never know the true difference between the right and the wrong and how we go. But you know, if we are not, pers if we're not pushing to move forward in the kingdom, we're never going to score. I've heard my, my, my wife give some advice to my daughter lately, and, and, and I've heard this advice in other places. We miss 100% of the shots we never take. You know, when you're in a new environment, she's in a new, she's in college in a new environment, so it's different. It's not high school anymore. It's not the same people and the same friends. So it's like going out and, you know, you know, it's like for people to make friends during COVID. It's not an easy thing. Everyone's like masked up. You can't see each other's face. And, and you know, there's just all that. You're in a totally different environment. You're in a different culture, all these things. And it's like going, if you never risk anything, you never gain anything. We miss 100% of the shots we never take. How many Christians are never scoring because they never try? It's better to fail than to have not even tried. I remember I played when I was, I, I came from Massachusetts, so hockey was the game where I grew up in. And I remember as a kid, I, I played hockey as a kid. Now that, I, I did know how to play, and I did play. And I remember when, it was my birthday. Okay, my birthday was in winter, and it was my birthday. I'm like going, I'm like, today, I'm going to score. So I decided, I'm like eight, nine years old or something. I decide with everything I have, I'm going to just rip it out, and I'm going to score. You know what I did? I got my first penalty. <laughs> Two minutes in the box. I'm not even sure what I did. I think I might have gone for that puck so hard I might have slapped some guy in the knees or something. You know, it's, it's not golf, it's hockey. But I went for it. And it wasn't long before I, I got my first assist and then I got my first goal. Because I was no longer going to set back and just kind of defense. I was going to go on the offense. Before long, they used, me as a they used me as a center and as a starter once in a while. And so when I got up on the wing and I wasn't always stuck on defense, but I got used on offense because I was willing to take a shot. Church, we have to get on the offense. There are people that need to know about Jesus Christ. We need to have spiritual goals that we're drawing closer to Christ, that we're becoming strong on Christ. Will the enemy attack us when that happens? Absolutely. But that's why you're wearing the spiritual armor. That's why you've got your equipment on. But if we never go on the offense, we'll never win. The third thing that's key to any player in any game is perseverance. Perseverance. 
You know, so many people, they start into the spiritual game, and then it overwhelms them, and they're like, mm, just stick me on the bench, coach. Or I quit. I don't want to be on the team anymore. God's looking for us to persevere. That verse back in Hebrews 12 told us to run the race with endurance. Endurance and perseverance very closely related to each other. God is looking for a team that's not going to lose steam. Amen? He's looking for a team that's not going to lose steam. When life comes at us, it can be rough. But he wants people who aren't going to quit or give up. How many of you get ticked off when you're watching your team just kind of let it go? When your team's out there playing and they're not doing their best, they're not trying their hardest, they're just lollygagging, lollygagging around on the field and they're not pushing it out. And you're like, come on, guys, do something. So I've been at games where I've heard people yell more at their team than at the other team because they're just not putting it out. Spectators get really mad at that. I personally feel ripped out when they just let the clock run out. I know they already won, but just fight. Just still try. Don't let the clock run out. Still go. I love a last-minute Hail Mary pass. And I've seen them win the game before, too. Perseverance. We need to persevere in spite of negative odds. We need to persevere in spite of feeling exhausted. We need to persevere when we're feeling battered or beat down because we'll never win the game without sticking to it. Don't give up until the timer runs out. And you know what that is for us, Christian? Death or rapture. So if you're breathing right now, the time does not run out. But I'm old. I don't care. You're still persevering. We're still going on. Recently, our, our, the superintendent, the, 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 the pastor who leads over the pastors of all of Rocky Mountain Ministry Network, he, he actually called on all the, the, the retired ministers to go into warfare prayer for all the pastors pastoring because it can be so difficult during this, this season to pastor. And he called them to warfare prayer to be praying on behalf because he's like, you know what? We're not done. We have to keep persevering. And a lot of those, those retired ministers, they're, pull, they're pulling it up and they've begun praying for different pastors and different people and different ones. Romans 5, verses 3 to 4 says, We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. When we persevere, our character is developed. When we persevere through the difficulty, we all love when you watch the Olympics, we all love when you watch someone's backstory about how they had an injury or, or a tragedy in their life or something happened and how they came back and pushed forward. And we root for them all the more to win and to be victorious because we saw how they persevered. Well, the, the, cloud, the, the clouds of those who've gone on in heaven, the Bible says that they're cheering us on to finish the game and to finish it well. We need to persevere. Hebrews 10.36 says patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. In order to receive the prize, we got to push on. We can't let, and I, I see way too many Christians, especially these days, when the going gets tough, the weak, quit, give up. But the tough do what? They get going. They get going. We need to persevere. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. You see, what we need to do is when we feel weak and down, we got to get back into that place with Jesus. We got to get back down to that place of prayer. We have to get back down with that word. We have to build up our faith, build up our trust, and rest and wait upon the Lord. And as we wait upon him, it says that he will renew our strength so we can keep persevering to win the prize. Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press on to reach the end of the race. And receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Because you see, church, we need a good defense. The enemy knows our weaknesses. We need to have a good defense so he can't win. So his wiles, his strategies become useless. We need to be on an offense. We can't just play a defensive game. We need to get on an offense and make forward motion for the kingdom of God and in our own lives spiritually. And we have to persevere to the end of the game. There's no giving up in the fourth quarter. 
There's no giving up in the third period. There's no giving up in the last inning. We need to push on until we have achieved the victory. Because the game's not over yet. So you can root this afternoon for the Buccaneers. I didn't even know that team existed. For the Buccaneers or the Chiefs. You can say, I'm not going to root for anybody because I like the Patriots or the Broncos. But the reality is the most important game is the spiritual game that you're playing. It's the one that Jesus gave his life for. It's the one that has the greatest horror and the greatest promise and the greatest price that we saw at the very beginning of the message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus gave his all so we could be victorious in the game. We need to get our game on and be victorious with him. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Kimberly, would you come on? Whether you're here in this room or if you're watching with us online this morning, How's your spiritual game? Right now, just ask yourself that question. How is your, how is my spiritual game? Have I lost some of my equipment? Am I forgetting to put my mouth guard in? Am I forgetting the salvation that was given to me? Are my cleats worn out? that I don't have the peace. Let's prepare ourselves for the defense. But we also have to ask, have I allowed myself to only be on the defense as a Christian or am I moving the game forward on the offense? I believe that's a place where so many Christians are today. We're not moving it forward on the offense. Jesus is saying, come on, we gotta score. We got to go out and get the victory. Yes, the enemy's going to try and tackle us. Yes, the enemy's going to come against us. But I promise you, the gates of hell won't prevail against my church. Go for it. In your own life, in your own pursuit of the knowledge of Christ, in your own desire to draw close to God, to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, but also in the need to proclaim Jesus to others so we can take as many with us. We're on the winning side. Some of you have been kind of tired. You ask the coach if you can sit on the bench. You're considering quitting the game and God's saying, hold it. Persevere. Persevere. Come wait on me. Put your trust in me and wait on me. I'm going to renew your strength. Right now, Jesus wants you to renew your strength. So where you are right now in your seat today, Whichever area God is just dealing with your heart about. Right now, I want you, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, to just surrender that part, that weakness in your game right now. You might have your game on, but you might be seeing your weaknesses right now. And I want you just to surrender those to Jesus. Whether it's defense or offense or perseverance, right now, I just want you where you're at to just say, God, I'm going to give this to you. If you haven't made a spiritual goal in a long time, I want you right now to make a goal. A goal to press into the word, to press into prayer, to press into proclaiming Jesus. Don't be afraid to go on the offense. We miss 100% of the shots we don't take. Jesus. Standing in his place, I worship you. Can you read the words, please? I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. 
Jesus, I pray in this room this morning that, Lord, on this game day, that, Lord, your church would put their game on. If you're willing to put your game on, stand to your feet. If you're willing to get your game on, if you recognize I need better defense, I need better offense, I need more perseverance, just stand to your feet right now. Lift up your hands to God and say, God, I want to put my best game on today. I want to put my best game on. Just reach out to the Lord. Say, Jesus, I want to have my best game on. We know we already win, but he doesn't want you sitting on the bench. He wants you to earn that Super Bowl ring. He wants you shooting for the most valuable player. Come on. Let's just get in the game and say, Jesus, yes, here I am. I want to be in the game. I'm on defense. I'm on offense. I will persevere, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd raise up your church stronger than ever before. Lord, ready, Lord, to stand against the wiles of the devil, Lord. Ready to press in and know you more, to score, Father. Ready to hold fast no matter what's coming at us in this life or in this world. We have the best coach of all times. We represent the best team of all, anywhere. We're on Jesus' team. So, Lord, today we surrender. We surrender to you. And we say, work in my heart, work in my life. I give it all to you, Jesus. I give it all to you, Jesus. Lord, I now pray, Father, that as we go from this place, that you would go before us. And Lord, when we're watching defense or offense or perseverance this afternoon, may we remember the spiritual game that we're in. And Lord, may we put on our spiritual game. May we put on our equipment. And may we be ready to be used by you, Lord. We might be in the room with with a relative who doesn't know you. Lord, give us opportunity to go on the offense and share Jesus. We might be in the room when a commercial that doesn't glorify you comes on. That might be a temptation in our life. Help us to put on our defense against it. And may we persevere for the kingdom of God. Be glorified in your church, I pray. Go with each one this day we ask. When we ask it, say it with me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as you go today, can I just make two words of encouragement to you? I want to encourage you next week. Kimberly and I won't be here, but focus on the family. George and Linda Stanky, counselors for Focus on the Family down in Colorado Springs. They're coming up. They do marital seminars, and they're doing a great service for Valentine's Day. We have a gift for everybody who comes for Valentine's Day next week as well. This was planned before we were going to be away. We want to encourage you to be here. Don't say, our oh, pastor's not going to be there. Make sure you come out. Also, if you haven't hit one of the discipleship groups, James is on Wednesday night. Keith is on Tuesday night. I'm online Thursday morning, or you can catch it later. Catch those studies. Get into them. Grow in Jesus. Make it a goal. Amen? Amen. And there are these two people in the back over here that I just I wanted a chance to just introduce. They have their masks on already. John and Don, just wave real quick. John and Don were... Recently, the pastors at Greenleaf First Assembly, but in January, he became our network's leader over the Rocky Mountain District as one of our officials as a secretary treasurer, and they're here with us this morning. So if you see them on your route today, just say hi to them. Amen? Amen. God bless you as you go.